Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting Harvesting Happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show where you will learn about age-proofing our brains for better living. My guest today is Dr. Mark Milstein who specializes in taking the leading science research on brain health and presenting it in a way that entertains, educates, and empowers his audience to live better. Dr. Milstein earned both his PhD in biological chemistry and his Bachelor of Science in Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology from UCLA. He has conducted research on topics including genetics, cancer biology, and neuroscience, and his work has been published in multiple scientific journals. And today we're talking about his new book, The Age-Proof Brain, New Strategies to Improve Memory, Protect Immunity, and Fight Off Dementia. Amen to that. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about our focus, focus at any age and why it is such a limited resource. Well, part of that is that I think of the brain like a battery, kind of like the battery of your cell phone. And as the day goes on, just like your cell phone battery, it depletes, it goes down. And the focus part of our brain is very similar. It's, it's our, our prefrontal cortex right, by, right behind our forehead. And so as the day goes on, it drains. And so it, it, we see this very clearly where at the end of the day, we don't usually make as good of decisions. <laughs> we, we tend to go off our diet. Um, and that's because <laughs> uh, as the focus and, and, and willpower, they're all related to this part of the brain. So it's, it's important to be aware of this and try to, try to be aware that we're not going to be at our optimal levels of focus throughout the day. There's times to, where it's more optimal. This is very interesting because I have observed my own brain on um, multiple hours of hard thinking. <laughs> and mm. I find that when I g get through a long session of really working my brain hard, I have this sensation of it like vibrating, like I need it to be quiet <laughs> <laughs> and my brain needs to settle. Yeah, I mean, the, the brain gets tired and that's something it's like a muscle, it fatigues. And so being aware of that and being aware of those cues and those feelings and saying, you know, now is time, now's the time to take a break, to recharge, take a nap or, or, you know, get some sleep. Uh, it's important to recharge the brain. And I know you mean, don't go get that cappuccino. <laughs> well, it, it, at times a little caffeine can be good, but it, uh, we want to keep it not too late in the day, especially if someone's sensitive to caffeine, but, and not making it the only thing we, re we rely on to, to recharge. Because then it will mess up your night. Right. Yeah. Interestingly, some people can actually have caffeine right before bed, uh, but for most people, it, it can throw off your ability to sleep. Absolutely. So as our focus is waning and what else is going on in our body when we're sort of just like losing steam? Well, blood sugar can drop as well, which makes it difficult to, to focus. Our brain runs on uh, sugar. Our, the brain is getting tired, less oxygen to the brain. The brain needs that oxygen. So if we're sitting too long, if we're focusing too long, and that's why getting up, walking around, getting the blood supply, getting the oxygen flowing, having a, a healthy snack, <laughs> all those things can recharge the brain uh, because, again, just like a, a battery, it drains. And it's, it's, not a, it's not an unlimited resource. Well, let's go back to focus and the myth mm -hmm. about multitasking versus unitasking. And mm -hmm. I mean, I know a little bit about this as a very poor multitasker. <laughs> and a rock star <laughs> unitasker. But right. tell us uh, what's happening in the brain when we're toggling back and forth between things. Well, a couple of things are happening. So definitely there's times in the day that we're multitasking is okay. But when we really want to remember something, we really want to make sure the information sticks. 
slowing down a little and saying, I'm just going to focus on this information and just this information alone. And a kind of a fun way to think about it is that there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus. And what we understand is that it's kind of like a waiting room and any information that you're trying to learn, you're trying to take in and experience and remember, it first goes to this part of your brain and it waits there. And in that time that the information is waiting there, your brain is actually really trying to get rid of it and throw it away because your brain doesn't want to fill up with useless information or things that your brain figures is not important. Uh And so by spending a few extra seconds and saying, I'm going to focus on this and nothing but this, convinces the brain that that information will then pass to other parts of the brain where you where you actually remember it. There's a lot of filtering going on because there's so much stimulation, there's so much happening, your brain doesn't want to fill up with all this noise that's happening in our day-to-day life. So something that's really simple is that, you know, when you're having those feelings, like I'm having trouble remembering, just slowing down a little and saying, I need to focus on this for an extra few seconds because a lot of our, our you know, day-to-day, where did I put my key, where, keys, where did I park my car? It really <laughs> boils down to, I'm, I was on to the next. I, was, I, was, I didn't take an extra few seconds. I just, one second here, one second there, from my phone to my computer to my TV, you know, talking during the conversation, cooking at the same time. And so a little bit of slowing down and focusing can go a long way. So it's like, like we're in a mindless state. When, when we're doing that, where we're, we're moving here and there, we're not even really recognizing that we're in the process of doing whatever that thing is. Yeah, that, that can be part of it as well. That, that ties into that uh, common notion of, you know, did I, did I lock the front door? Did I, did, I, did, I, uh, did I close the garage door? Did those things happen? We can be so distracted and sort of going through the motions that sort of shaking ourselves out of that and saying, you know, I'm present, I'm really focusing on what happened, on what's happening can also be helpful for remembering. So when we talk about eliminating the distraction, are you suggesting that just the act of slowing down and the commitment to the one task at hand is a way for us to, you know, optimize our functioning? Yes. So some things you can do are if the phone is distracting, which it is for many, many people. Always. Uh, it, yes, always is taking a moment and saying, you know, I'm going to leave this in the other room while I try to focus on this task or even setting a timer and saying, I'm going to spend a few minutes. It, it's kind of like, I, again, going back to this idea of your brain has aspects of it that are like going to the gym or, or you know, working out your body that if you want to work on your focus, you can take some time and say, you know, today I'm going to spend five minutes with just focusing on this one thing I need to do to do. It's like going to the gym and doing some reps. Then the next day, you know, try seven minutes. The next day, try 10 minutes, build up. Uh, that makes that part of the brain, that prefrontal cortex stronger. We see very clearly we can increase the size and the strength of that part of the brain. And, and so it doesn't mean we have to be focusing like that for hours on end. There are actually studies that show that taking a break at some point, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes in, depending on the person is helpful. But that, that you know, non-distracting focus at some points during the day can be really uh, remarkable for our, our productive productivity. I think you make a very good point in your book, The Age Proof Brain, about training the brain. You know, if we look at, as you said, our brain as a muscle and how we train our muscles, and if we want to tone a muscle, we repeat the exercise multiple times with a light weight. Mm-hmm. And exactly. Th- this is what th- you're suggesting the same thing for mental fitness. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's about repetition. It's about muscle confusion. So what I mean by that is that, you know, when you go to the gym, you want to repeat the exercises, which is important for things you're trying to do mentally. You want to, you know, practice makes, I always say almost perfect. <laughs> you can get better at things, maybe not perfect, but closer and closer. And then the other thing is, is that if you notice when you go to the gym, if you do the same exercise over and over again, it gets stale. We don't seem to see the gains. And so there's this, this idea in fitness called muscle confusion where you try new things. And it's the same thing with the brain is that when things are getting stale and you're having trouble focusing, something as simple as a new environment, go to a new room, go to a new coffee shop. You know, that's why on vacations we tend to have that, oh, I have this new idea, you know, that if you're in a new environment. So don't be afraid of, of switching things up as well. And balancing that between saying, you know what, I need to just really eliminate some distractions here and focus. So it's a balance. And when we talk about age proofing our brains, you know, I, I think what you're suggesting is this um, constant newness that's also paired with routine. So, you know, like mixing things up, as you say, but then the ritual and the routine of, of activity is essential. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. 
Talk a little bit about how age-proofing our brain protects our immune system. Yeah, absolutely. So what we see is that our, our immune system and our brain, there's these connections. And so the book really delves into these ideas about that. We tend to think of our brain health as uh, it's almost like an island unto itself. But what we realize is that it's, it's not just about, you know, doing mental exercises, which are good, but it's also about taking care of our body as a whole, that it's all very much connected. So there's, there's these, these, what we think of as two-way streets. So when it comes to your immune system, what we realize is that by um, managing our stress, um, by, by taking care of our brain, our stress response is very much related to our immune response. So if we, if, we, if we have unmanaged stress, that can cause the immune system to go awry. And at the same time, it's the other direction that if our immune system is not balanced and under control, that can lead to an inflammatory process. So inflammation can actually send signals to the brain that attack the brain. Just like your immune system is needed to attack viruses and dangerous bacteria, it can turn on our own body and cause autoimmune issues and autoimmune issues with the brain. So we want to be thinking about how do we take care of all of these systems uh, together to optimize our brain health and, and keep our brain more youthful. So it's not an anti-aging statement. It's just we want to protect the brain. It's a whole health statement also. Yeah, and absolutely. in turn, that yeah. protects the brain. Yes. And, and what role does a good diet, you know, nourishing ourselves with high quality foods, what impact it, does it, that play? Yeah, it's about, it's, it's right at the top of the list. It's <laughs> one of the most practical you know, actionable things that we can do. We have these really fascinating studies that show that even what we eat can impact how clearly we're thinking and how well we're performing on a, on a task or a test, like within an hour. Yeah. And we also see that what we eat can impact our brain health years down the road. So, you know, whole, I know, you know, you're very well versed in this idea, but this idea of whole natural foods, most of the time, um, is something that we know calms down our immune system so that we have less inflammation which then is protecting the brain. So it's, it's what's happening in the gut, what's happening, what we're eating um, has this protective Im, uh, impact on our brain health day to day and years down the road. And is the Mediterranean diet, which is prescribed for so many things, also applicable in terms of brain health? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually where we see a lot of data, um, where we see um, that people who follow a Mediterranean-like diet most of the time, so there's something called the MIND diet, which is very similar to the Mediterranean diet. Where we actually see um, people who follow this diet have reductions in their um, risk of developing dementia. Um, and we believe that's related to heart health. It, these are heart healthy diets. These are uh, immune healthy diets. Um, so these things are critically important. And so what's also nice about Mediterranean diets is that they're, they can be easier to follow. <laughs> there's other diets out there that are you know, it's hard to follow something and stick to something that's, that's really challenging, whereas Mediterranean gives people some really good options and some, and some leeway and a lot of, you know, good tasting, healthy food. Oh, yeah. Delicious food. I, I think it's the yeah. Mediterranean diet combined with the Mediterranean lifestyle. <laughs> that's what uh, I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is such a, such a good point is that it, it's, it's the fresh food. It's the walking to pick up the food. It's the having the good conversation around the dinner table. It's all those things are so important. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk about the roles of diet, exercise and sleep and mental health in addition to brain health. But let's first take that break and we'll return to the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Mark Milstein. We're talking about the age proof brain, new strategies to improve memory, protect immunity and fight off dementia. To connect with Dr. Milstein, please do so at drmarkmilstein.com on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Mark Milstein and Mark is with a C. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. And that is actually a promise. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, urge them to seek professional support because good psychological health is vital in achieving a satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness, sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your tribe through social media. Find us at Harvesting Happiness on Facebook and me at Lisa Kamen on Twitter. 
And we're back continuing the conversation with Dr. Mark Milstein. We're talking about age-proofing our brains for better living. Let's get back to it. So Mark, let's go back for a second to that hippocampus, to that waiting room in the brain where information is taken in and either stored into other parts of the brain or the information that download is gotten rid of. How does a healthy hippocampus contribute to A, good mental health, and B, um, uh, a healthy brain as we age and minimizing um, risks for dementias? Yeah, that's, that's an important point. So the hippocampus is the part of the brain that's involved with formation. And actually, we now believe retrieval of memory. And what the good news is about this part of the brain is that we have some control over keeping it strong. So we see that when people, for example, do the things that I talk about in the book, a simple thing is, you know, walking. If they walk um, about 30 minutes a day, their hippocampus tends to get bigger or stronger. If they practice mindfulness, that's another thing that, you know, stress management, because we see that our mental health is related to our hippocampus as well, as you brought up. So if we're in constant states of stress, for example, too much too often, the cortisol hormone can shrink the hippocampus, make it very difficult to remember things. And we also see it in cases of, for example, depression, we see a, a, a reduction in the size of the hippocampus to be difficult to remember new information, learn new, new information when people are suffering from depression. So we see that there's these powerful connections here that our mental health uh, can impact our, our brain health. And just to put this all in perspective, in the last two years, uh, two and a half years with, with COVID, we've actually seen the rates of depression jump from about eight and a half percent to about 33% in our country. Oof. And we also... And we also see that individuals who have unmanaged depression and anxiety, on average, develop dementia about five years uh, before individuals who don't have these conditions. So we realize that we're really putting the, the pieces of the puzzle together to say that we need to prioritize our mental health, of course, today, not only because of our day-to-day -day wellness, but it's also a key piece of the puzzle to lower risk of dementia down the road. And one of the best ways to do that is through body movement. Absolutely. Yeah. Through, through exercise, movement, dancing, all those things are important. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about a study that was released uh, recently about optimal steps per day of brisk walking that is said to decrease dementia. And I believe the number was between 3,800 and 9,800 steps a day. Yeah. A very interesting study. And the idea is, is that we see this evidence also, and we've seen it now for several years, that about 30 minutes a day of walking is a nice number to think about. Um, there's some studies that followed people for a couple decades and found that people who walked about 30 minutes a day lowered their risk of dementia by about 60%, which is pretty pretty amazing. That's huge. But also, yeah, it's huge. It's re something really simple. And what's nice about it is that they actually found that it didn't have to all be done at the same time. So, you know, walking, parking your car a little farther for an errand walking around your house, walking with a friend, all these things add up. They're all, they're all part of that 30 minutes. And something that was interesting in that recent study you just mentioned that we were also seeing is that don't be afraid of giving your walk a little bit of a push, <laughs> a little bit of an extra speed. We call this um, the gate of the walk. And there's really interesting studies that show that people who have a, a faster walk, you don't have to power walk, you don't have to speed walk, but a little bit faster uh, of a pace to their walk tend to have more youthful brains. So it's, it's probably related to our ability to control our balance a little bit uh, more blood pumping to the brain. So don't be afraid to give your walk, you know, a little bit of a push and, and, and a little bit more speed at times. Here's a, a sidebar question. Does yeah. the brisk walk or the impact of the foot hitting the pavement also contribute to muscle retention? Yeah, that's such a great question. So actually there, people always ask, you know, is it all, is it just about walking? What about all these other forms of exercise? Any exercise is great. But what we are seeing is there is something about just what you said, the foot hitting the ground. That activity we're seeing uh, sends what we're calling a pressure wave in these studies. It, it not only tones muscles, it actually sends signals basically from our foot up our leg to our heart. It synchronizes the relationship and the connection between our heart and our brain, which is one of the most profound, important connections for brain health. Even little dips in oxygen can damage uh, our memory and our brain. So there is there's something to trying to fit in, no matter what exercise you love, tr try, to, try to fit in some walking in your routine. It, it's an important piece. Your body and your brain will thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very true. So let's roll along to sleep and cognitive mm -hmm. functioning. I mean, sleep is something that 
most people in the Western world are deprived of. We don't get enough. Definitely. So talk a little bit about what sleep does for us and why it's so important. Well, sleep does a lot for our brain in terms of everything you learn during the day. You make a connection between your brain cells, but you make the connection stronger while you're sleeping. And that's why if we don't get a good night's sleep, we don't remember the things we learned that day nearly as well. We could spend hours talking about all the things that sleep does for our brain, but I always like to say one of the most bizarre and you kind of head, head, you know, a head awakening wakes us up to think, wow, this is really important is that our brain actually fills up with waste and garbage and toxins throughout the day. It's just part of life. And when we're sleeping is when we remove that waste. We actually, our brain actually essentially squeezes it out huh. and washes it away. And if we don't get a good night's sleep, we leave too much of this waste or this trash or these toxins in our brain. And over time, the the buildup of that waste is what we're concerned about in terms of the, the aging brain, raising the risk of dementia. It's kind of like your house if it, or your apartment or wherever you, you live. If it's filled with too much garbage and waste, it's hard to be productive. It's hard to focus. Same thing with the brain. We want to clean it out every night, and we do that by getting a good night's sleep. So sleep helps us flush our brains. It helps us synthesize information that we have taken in during the day. How about problem solving? Yeah, that's that's the... That's an interesting one. So we do see this. We see this idea that, you know, you have something that you, it could be a big or a small problem. And you, you've heard the old advice, go sleep on it. And there's some really interesting aspects to that. One is that while you're sleeping, your brain is thinking in, a, in an out of the box fashion. You're, you're allowing your brain to work on things we believe in ways that it might not work on them during the day. And, and people report this. They say, oh, you know, I woke up and I I found the solution or I, I, I wrote the song, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought of the thing and, and, and there, there's so, it, it's still quite mysterious, but it makes sense scientifically in this idea that when we're, when we're sleeping and when we're dreaming, our brain is freed up. It's not as the prefrontal cortex, which is very kind of like the drill sergeant of the brain takes a break, allows the brain to be more free, allows, to think, allows us to think about things from different angles. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, fun thing to think about is that, you know, if you're having some having trouble thinking about or solving a problem, don't be don't be afraid to to pose yourself the problem before bed and see what your brain comes up with in the morning. Yeah, I, I, for me, I, I do solve a lot of problems when I sleep. You know, set the intention, like you know, I uh, I need some information about how to how to do this, and right. stuff does come in, in yeah. the dream state. It's pretty yeah. amazing. There's so yeah, there's so much about our brain that we don't completely understand, but we experience and we say, you know, and just like you said, we have these experiences and, and tapping into them is a fun thing to think about and talk about. Let's talk about mood and the aging brain, you know, why Mm -hmm. it's important to have solid mental health, to have a feeling, a, a sense of satisfaction with the life that we are leading, even if it's not the perfect life and how that impacts our health as we age. Yeah, it, this is an area where we have studies that I would say are are a bit surprising in in terms of. Well, I'll just give you some some interesting stats. One is that studies have found that people who have a positive attitude towards the aging process tend to have a lower risk of dementia. Um, people who are more optimistic tend to have a lower risk of dementia. So it's about exactly what you said, having a, a perspective that is you know things don't have to be perfect for us to have a, a good attitude towards them. Being aware that there's the reality that things are difficult and challenging at times. Um, but if we can overall find the good, um, find the positive moments, find the good experiences, our brain naturally tends to think about negative things. It, it helps us survive and it helped us um, solve problems. But in our day-to-day world, which is filled with, you know, the reality is there's bad news and there's negativity and there's struggles. But if we can take moments to say, you know, I need to focus on all the things I have gratitude for, all the things that I'm thankful for, all the things that, that are, are, are meaningful, that just a few extra moments or minutes a day doing that can reshift some balance. And, and we realize that that very likely calms down our immune system, protects our heart, lowers inflammation, and thus protects the brain. This is great. This is, these are all really great tips and, and, and fairly simple interventions. Like, you know, you're not suggesting that people go out and learn how to become a trapeze artist, right? You're just saying, right, right. get out, move your body, get some good sleep eat well, you know, if you can't read the ingredients on the package, you probably shouldn't eat it, you know, things like that. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. It does. It's not about, 
um, you know, the latest fad or the latest gadget. It, it's really more about getting back to some simple, practical things that I like to say, little things that can have a big impact that, you know, they're easy to forget. They're easy to not make a habit in our, in our modern world, but there's ways that we can instill them uh, and make them habits and make them stick. Thank you, Dr. Mark Milstein. We've been talking about the age-proof brain, new strategies to improve memory, protect immunity, and fight off dementia. To learn more, please visit drmarkmilstein.com, on Facebook at Dr. Mark Milstein, and on Instagram, that handle is also Dr. Mark Milstein, and Mark is with a C. Mark, thanks so much for sharing part of your day with me. Thank you. Great, great time. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Cayman on behalf of my guest, Dr. Mark Milstein, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.